and this thought comes to me a lot when I'm in the doldrums, shall we say, where would it have been easier if he had just died? You know, because you're, you're kind of living with with a person that is not the same person that you married, and you know, it, it's it's just that fleeting thought of, ugh, you know, ugh, <laughs> yeah. Look, a carer would think that, and that's not a bad thing. So whoever's listening out here who's thought that, you know, do not feel bad about it. Of course, if he had passed away long term, you know, there would have been things that were completely different. But then you would have been going through the emotional pain and trauma of all that kind of stuff, and that wouldn't have been so good. So there is no better or worse or anything. There's always a situation around stroke, whether somebody lives, passes away, is amazingly well afterwards or not so well, you're never going to reconcile it. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. So, Royce, welcome to the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, glad to finally have you here. Sorry that I uh, forgot our uh, Skype <laughs> session this morning. It's okay. It really is okay. Yeah. So um, morning my time, but not your time. Nope, just about uh, almost five o'clock my time. How's the weather in California? Uh, well, I don't know if you can see behind me, but we're having an, a, yet again another storm. We live up in the mountains, so <coughs> we're uh, between the snow and the rain this year. It's just been nonstop. Yeah, so that's a good thing or a bad thing that it's snowing and raining? Well, my husband loves it because he loves to just sit around and do his jigsaw puzzles all day long, but I go a little crazy. (laughs) (laughs) As the wife of a a stroke survivor, you're entitled to go a little crazy. Uh, I feel that way too, yes. (laughs) Stroke stroke survivors tend to be a little bit uh, needy. Yes, just a little. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about what happened to your husband. Well, he was 56 and in perfect health, so we thought, and um, vegetarian for years, very holistic. He was a massage therapist, very, very active, athletic. Uh, We owned a business together. Everything was fine. And all of a sudden, about a week before the stroke, I noticed that his eye was beet red. I thought, well, that's strange. And I noticed that he wasn't He's a math genius, literally a math genius. And so I noticed that he wasn't able to put sums together real fast. And I thought, well, that's really odd. Well, it must be stress because the business we owned was a retail shop and gallery, and it was in uh, November. So I just figured, oh, it must be, you know, fourth quarter stress, you know, getting ready for the holidays. And um, I had gone to bed. It was... November 13th, I believe, something like that, gone to bed. And he said he was just going to stay in the living room and just kind of work on relaxing and make me feel a little bit better because he was feeling weird. And about three in the morning, I felt him poking my leg. And I said, what's going on? He said, I feel weird. And I said, okay, well, what does that mean? And he said, I feel weird. And I said, you know, one of those things that kind of comes to you when you least expect it. I said, well, stick out your tongue. Wow. And he stuck out his t- Yeah, I know. Stuck out his tongue, and it was, you know, he couldn't do it. And I said, oh, my God, I think you're having a straw. And I couldn't say those words, but I knew it. Put clothes on, rushed him out the door, got him to the hospital within five minutes, and they said, yeah, he's having a stroke. And it, um, I was, I knew nothing about strokes. All I knew was, oh, he'll be better in a couple hours. (laughs) And so they started, you know, they hooked him up to all the machines and did all the things that doctors did. And nobody, you know, nobody said anything to me, really. They asked me a lot of questions, but, you know, and at that point he couldn't talk and he couldn't move. You know, it was was a mess. And um, So we are recording in March of 2019. When did the stroke happen? It's been a little over four years. So, wow. yeah, 2014, November. Wow. wow. Yeah. So in November 2014, I had surgery to remove the blood vessel that was damaged in my head. Oh, wow. And I kept bleeding. So I'm curious, what type of stroke did your husband have? Did you, did you, do you know? Yes, it's an ischemic or ischemic. ischemic I don't ever yeah. remember. Yes, yeah. 
and uh, it affected his right side. So he has no movement in his hand, his arm. He's sort of able to walk and he lost speech. Okay. Um, we've been going to a zillion therapies for four years and it's, you know, things are slowly getting better, but not at all like he used to be. Yeah. Yeah. So what caused the blockage in the, sh in the uh, particular vessel that was affected? They're, they have no idea. It's just one of those things. His dad had a stroke, so they think it might be genetic. Yeah. Um, he had high blood pressure, which we didn't really know about. He was uh, type 2 diabetic, which we kind of knew. We were, you know, He had eliminated sugar from his diet, so we knew that was under control. But everything else, we were very holistic and very anti-Western medicine, shall we say. So you know, it was just a complete and utter shock. It really was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Royce, your your comment was interesting that you thought that he'd be okay in a few days or something along oh, those I lines. Oh, I thought a few hours. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it interesting? We No one really knows almost anything about stroke until what happens to them. And mm -hmm. I remember having a bleed in my brain and the people that I knew, my family and friends who were concerned, said the same kind of thing to me. Oh, you know, it's no big deal. You know, it'll pass. It's just a small bleed. This thing happens from time to time. And it's like they knew about this bleed that happens from time to time. I don't know how they knew about that. And they were really conf confident. I don't know whether they were trying to make me feel good or what. They were really confident that, yeah, no, this will pass. It won't be, it won't be a big deal. We're seven years later and we're, I wouldn't call it past it yet. You know, we're still in the thick of it and I'm a lot better. Um, and feeling better, but there's some things that I have that are ongoing that are not going away in a hurry by the same, you know, by the by, by the looks of things. So, um, how long did your husband stay in hospital? He was in the regular acute care. Uh, he was in, he moved he was moved into ICU, which was my first clue that there was something big going on. And he was there for couple days and then they moved him into acute care he was there for 10 days and then I found out about an amazing rehab hospital in uh, Downey which is about half an hour from us and miraculously I got in I, I must admit I had a, a contact there that got me in got us in and so he was there for almost six weeks yeah and he's been an outpatient there ever since yeah and when he woke up from the stroke uh he immediately had lost the use of his right side of his body. And then yeah. was there a, a time of rehabilitation or what, what, what happened after that? Yeah, there was a ton of rehab. Um, looking back on it, they didn't do as much rehab in the acute care hospital that they started to do in the rehab hospital. But they did a few things. Uh, you know, it wasn't their specialty. Um, but once he was moved into the rehab hospital, he had probably at least five or six hours of rehab a day. So it was very intense. And I guess they say in the first six months, that's when the most change happens. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. So at the moment, he's able to walk. Let us um, let me first ask you, what's your husband's name? Michael. Let's just call him Michael instead of he and him and his. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's fine. Um, so, um. So Michael's not able to walk at the moment. Um, is he able to stand independently or do anything like that? Is he walking with a walker? How, how does he get around? Yeah, he's walking with a quad cane, and he can walk for maybe five minutes. But I think the most effect that the stroke had on him was in the frontal lobe area. I just thought that he had gotten lazy from this, and... <laughs> Many of his therapists finally said, you know, Royce, he's not lazy. He just doesn't care because it affected his frontal lobe. So he's not motivated to get better, um, which is so bizarre because he was so active and so he was a huge participant in so many different things. And for him not to care is just like living with a stranger. So, yeah, it's very bizarre. Yeah. So it'd be very difficult for you because at the beginning, you don't know how the stroke impacting his brain affects him and how it changes him. You just see something that's different and you think, come on, don't you really want to get better? Aren't you motivated? 
And what uh-huh. you don't realize is that there is a part of the brain that causes or, or supports motivation. And when that goes away, it goes away. Yes. And so it's become my job. And I, I tell him this several times a day, sometimes nicely. <laughs> it's my job to remind him, well, you know, the old Michael would be very upset to see how this new Michael is. So, you know, why don't we do some more physical therapy and why don't we try harder and what, you know, and I I have a a home program that I do with him all the time and, you know, but it's really, I'm the one behind all of it. He, if if it were up to him, he would just sit around all day and do jigsaw puzzles, you know, really and truly. Yeah. How does that affect you personally? How do you feel about that? Now you're living in a home with a person who doesn't appear to have the same personality with the person who you really looked up to and admired to although you probably look up up to michael and admire him now still you know there's this massive comparison that you that people make and and, and see the difference of i went through it with my partner you know she noticed some changes in me that she wasn't pleased with but it wasn't my fault How, how does that make you feel i'll tell you it's been a roller coaster that's for sure uh I think I have gone, I've, I've really run the gamut of every emotion in the book from complete and utter sadness to hopelessness, to anger, to guilt, uh, to sort of acceptance. Um, yeah. I think it just depends on the minute. You know, yeah. there's sometimes that I just go, I can't believe this. <laughs> this is my life. Yeah. You know, and there are other times that, you're still the same person yeah. who I fell in love with. You know, we've been together for 33 years and that hasn't changed, you know, and he's in there, he is in there yeah. and it comes out once in a while, you know, not verbally, but it comes out in other ways. So yeah, it's been, I must say, this is probably the biggest challenge I've ever experienced in my life ever. Yeah. So yeah. So what's interesting, you know, what I'd like to do is try to paint a picture for people about, you know, what, carers go through because i imagine now you've become his carer so how has that impacted your life as well because i imagine that the two of you would have been active working uh bringing an income in and now this is a completely different situation four years later so i imagine that michael's no longer able to earn an income and now you're his carer how has that shifted everything it has shifted everything, yes. <laughs> well, like I said, we owned our own business, and he was a massage therapist as well. And uh, so we had to close the business, needless to say. At first I thought, oh, I'll just take him to the, the shop with me, and he can just sit there all day. And that mm, that didn't work. So <laughs> closed the business. And in California, there's a, a program called In-Home Support Services, where um, if you're on Medi-Cal, which is our, you know, California uh, low-income insurance, if you're on Medi-Cal, you can qualify to be somebody's caregiver through this uh, in-home support service program, which is great. So um, that's how we live. You know, he gets a little bit of disability, I get Social Security, and I get uh, the IHSS payment every month. So, and we moved up to the mountains. And we love it here. You know, we're away from the hustle and bustle of L.A. And um, it's actually quite peaceful. And I I do, you know, freelance writing and I do all kinds of other stuff on the side as well. So, yeah, but it literally changed everything. Yeah. So you had to find a way to reinvent yourselves so that you can still continue to support yourselves and, uh, and do things differently because everything is different now. Yes, definitely. Yeah. It's an experience that I think every stroke survivor and carer goes through. Um, And I know that a lot of the things that that I wanted to do, that I was motivated to get back to work to do, and I was lucky because the damage that happened to me wasn't so dramatic that I couldn't walk for months and months. It was a number of months where I had to regain my ability to walk and the use of my left arm. I I really wanted to get back to work because, you know, we had, we have two kids, you know, we have a lot of, outgoings you know just like any other person and it was not being able to go back to work made it feel really like i was no i was no good i was not able to contribute or you know it makes you 
consider your self worth and your even your manhood, you know, even all that kind of stuff. So it's really yeah. bizarre this this thing that you experience, and it's not your fault, but you still blame yourself for all these things that have happened and so on. Um, so, what about you? Did you have any kind of guilt or regrets or anything like that that you experienced? <laughs> you pegged it. Yep, guilt was my middle name. Yeah, because I kept thinking I should have known. What about that red eye? How could I have ignored that? He was so stressed, and he he wasn't the same person for two weeks before the stroke. And I kept sensing it. I kept intuitively feeling it, but I didn't do anything about it because I just chopped it all off. So that's taken me, yeah, a long time to get past, you know, and I, I've had to really work hard you know, to alleviate that sense of responsibility, which also is known as guilt. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, the truth is he he wasn't responsible as well. You know, it was both of us. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that there's no such thing as responsibility in that situation. When you noticed something was wrong, when you really knew, you actually did something about it. Both of you. Yeah. He said, I'm feeling <laughs> weird. You said, what does that mean? Okay, poke your tongue out. You did all the right things. But how does a red eye ever mean it's a stroke? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. How? In fact, I've, I've told many doctors that story, and they all kind of say, wow, I've never heard of a red eye meaning a stroke. You know, but looking at it now, it's like, oh, yeah, well, something was bleeding in there, and it was causing his eye to get red. Yeah. So that was just his way of, of manifesting the symptoms. Yeah, and the other thing is you're not aware of what type two diabetes means, even though he was on the verge of of being on a, a, a type two diabetic or not, you're not really aware of what that means because, you know, how does it mean stroke and all this kind of stuff? And he also had high blood pressure, so even that doesn't necessarily compute to people that that can lead to stroke. But they're the two of the main risk factors. Looking back, you know, now that we're aware, are high blood pressure and type two diabetes. Yeah. for, for yeah. stroke and this is the challenge this is the challenge with trying to raise awareness for people is they don't connect the dots between stroke and you know what seem to be benign conditions like uh, type 2 diabetes which you can take a tablet for or high blood pressure which you could take a tablet for so this medical system that you you know find it difficult to be kind of a part of like I was initially and and is that they teach people that if you take a tablet you'll sort out your high blood pressure and if you take a tablet you'll sort out your type 2 diabetes but they don't give you enough information in order to affect your life in a positive way so you're not needing to take the tablet for type 2 diabetes and you're not needing to take the tablet for um, high blood pressure but you find natural ways to heal and remedy that, which is potentially dealing with emotional, you know, distress, uh, high levels of stress at work, uh, eating better. You know, there's a whole bunch of things we can do, but they're not keen on us doing that. So I get your, you know, your issue with the medical methodology or system, but let's face it, without it, uh, I wouldn't be here and Michael wouldn't be here. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so they're good at getting yeah. you back out of hospital and at home, which I think is where the, where the real talent of the medical profession exists. And they're good at dealing with symptoms at a, a small moment in time, but they're not good at dealing with the ongoing recovery. And that's where we have to take responsibility for that. And you're left alone to do that anyway. So if you don't right. take responsibility for it, you really struggle and you suffer more than you need to, at least that's the way I see it. So um, you took to writing to yes. share your story, and that's, I think, how I came across your specific uh, post on Instagram. I saw your, your post and it looked into it and found that you had written a book about your experience. Tell me a little bit about what motivated you to write this book. Well, there I was sitting in the hospital with Michael and not really knowing what to do. Um, we had a lot of friends, a lot of clients, a lot of customers that didn't know what was going on. 
so I, I put this little tiny post telling everybody that Michael had had a stroke and we're at the hospital and, you know, I would keep them posted. Well, within minutes, <laughs> I had hundreds of responses, literally hundreds of responses. And I just thought, okay, well, that's interesting. And I just started doing longer and longer posts. And at one point, several people all at the same time said to me, you know, these posts are really not only informative, but you're like sharing from your, your, your heart. You know, um, I'm a spiritual teacher also. And I, I decided to just be very authentic on my posts. Um, but each time I would, sh I would share something, it would be, I would share what was going on, but I would talk about it in sort of, sort of a spiritual way. I would say, you know, this is going on, but this is the lesson I'm learning from it. Or this is what Michael is doing, and this is how I'm seeing it in a spiritual viewpoint. And so, so many people said that I needed to put this, these thoughts together and turn them into a book because it would be very helpful for, for other people, you know, going through similar things. So when I took Michael home, every time I would have a spare minute, I would, I would do another post and I'd send it out. And then I started putting them all together. And within about a year, I had, you know, a 350 page book. <laughs> Lo and behold, there it was. Wow. And I self published, and the rest is history. Um, What's the book called? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, oh, it's called Back. And the, then a, a uh, whatever it's called, semicolon, uh, Rebirth After Stroke. And when I started writing it, I was thinking, well, you know, I'll just write it until he gets better. <laughs> you know that's where the rebirth after stroke came from and at the end of the book I said well this is the end of our first year and he's we're still working at it so <clears throat> so I'm hoping that I I transmit the idea that strokes do take a long time and to never give up hope you know, there are so many people at the rehab hospital that we go to as an outpatient that stop us in the hall and just you know take me by the shoulders and say don't give up just don't ever give up and these people have been coming there for 10 years 20 years and they still make progress so yeah I've, what, I've taken that to heart yeah that's fair enough um that's a good thing to take to heart one of the yeah. um one of the things with stroke that people don't realize is that the recovery continues and sometimes there's a you know, we talk about neural plasticity, you know, the ability mm -hmm. for the brain to change itself and to react. But there's also a another form of neural plasticity that people aren't aware of, and that's the negative neural plasticity, which is neural plasticity, but you can unlearn stuff as well. So you can sit there and decide that you're not going to get better, and in fact, you're going to grow the neurons that support you're not going to get better, and you exactly. won't get better. Or you can sit there and go, well, I'm going to continue to try and get better. And um, you will continue to try and get better. I definitely say that what I feel is always there. It never goes away. But I am better every day than I was the day before. And that makes me feel emotionally better at least. And then if my emotions are kept uh, buoyant, then that makes me forget about what I'm experiencing in my hand or in my leg or you know when I'm tired and that kind of creates a better version of me ongoing even though that experience is still the same the the way I deal with it rationalize with it is better and therefore I am a better version of myself you know absolutely yeah and the other thing that's interesting is that I recently read a, uh, a study from uh, a book from uh, Dr. Norman Doidge who talks about the brain's way of healing is the topic of the book. And that particular book talks about how after many, many years of getting people um, uh, who can't move limbs and retraining them, you know, with different versions of training that they uh, gain improvements in the limbs that they haven't been able to use. And one of the things is for people who have, you know, paralysis on one side, is especially with arms, is to they do a exercise. I'm not sure if it's called um, restriction. It's a restriction exercise or something like that, where they tie oh, yeah. they tie the the good arm, you know, to the body with a sling just for a few hours, so that if that person needs to go and get a glass of water, they have no choice but to use the arm 
that doesn't work as well. Yeah, I've and, heard about that. Yeah, and what that does is that creates a level of a different version of, you know, retraining that because you can't do it with your other arm. And if you can't do it with your other arm at all, well, then you have to start getting movement back in the arm that is not supposed, you know, is not really working to its fullest extent. So something to consider perhaps. I'm not sure if you've heard of that or what other exercises people have told you guys to do, but that was something that I read about just recently I thought I'd share. Yeah, I've, I've had several therapists mention that to me, and every time they mention it, they say they're not really sure if they use it or if it's still using, if it actually works or not, but they have talked to me about it. So it just sounds so, I don't know, scary, <laughs> like torturous. Well, yeah. Um, if your experience is torturous, then it, I suppose it would be torturous. I guess so. The way that you, <laughs> however, if you're, if you're uh, the kind of um, person who thinks about uh, a bit of tough love or hard love yeah. or whatever you right. want, right? Then it's not so bad. You know, it's loving. Uh, it's a loving thing. And what it does is it doesn't really uh, restrict the arm terribly so that the person's in pain or anything. It just stops them from being able to lift up at the elbow and out, you know, to get that movement just for a few hours mm -hmm. or even 10 minutes or 15 minutes at the beginning. And it just to see whether or not that person can get motivated to move that. Now, I know that Michael has a challenge with being motivated. Yes. And um, that's not his fault, but something that's caused by the, um, by the injury that he experienced. So that might be a little bit more challenging for you guys to set that up, but uh, uh, something to consider at least. And for people listening, perhaps, who haven't considered that yet, maybe they can also consider that. Yeah, it's very interesting. It really is. I have to talk to his therapist about that, yeah. So tell me a little bit about how does a carer go about becoming educated in the space that you needed to? Not formally, I imagine, but your one day before the stroke, you're just a normal person, you're going about your things, running your business, and all of a sudden, you need to be a carer. I imagine that's a steep learning curve. How did you find yourself dealing with what you needed to know? Well, I started observing every single therapist that worked with him, and they would all say to me, you have to participate, you have to do this, you have to learn this, and I really resisted at first because, of course, he was going to be better in just a matter of a week or so, so I didn't really need to learn it. But I also found, and I, I would say this to all of the people that were working with him, he had the stroke, but my brain turned to mush. I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend what people were saying to me. I'd have to have, can you repeat this? I'd have to write it down. They would put little signs up in his room for me. It was horrible. I mean, I literally couldn't keep anything. I couldn't retain any information. Um, even to the point of, you know, where they would kind of teach me how to walk with him to, you know, be on his right side and, you know, brace his leg and do all of that stuff. I couldn't do it, you know. And so finally, when it was time to leave the hospital, his wonderful physical therapist said, okay, <laughs> you're on your own. And he, he had never taught me how to get him into a car. And I was like, like freaking out. What do I do? How do I get him in the car? You know, he says, well, you'll figure it out. And I did, and I had to, you know, but I, I think a lot of it was, was that, and it, it just slowly started to come back to me and took him home, and he fell a couple of times, and I had to figure out how to get him up and all that stuff, and all the training that I had witnessed for six weeks came back to me. But, it was, you know, I, I know a lot of it was me resisting. I didn't want this role, so I didn't, I didn't want to hear it, you know, la, la, la. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it was, it was really tough. And fair enough, why would you want that role? Why would anyone want that role? Yeah, yeah. And I can understand why you would resist it. You know, your whole identity is being challenged now. You know, you were a wife. Now you've got to be a, a carer and now you've got to learn all these skills that, you know, quite frankly, no one wants to know these skills because no one wants their loved one to be unwell so that you right. need to know those skills, true? Yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I think, I guess for me, you know, because he's he's become kind of childlike too. He sort of he does silly goofy things that he never would do as an adult. 
you know, he's a, a very funny guy. He has a very funny sense of humor, but now he does things that are something a three-year-old would do, you know? And so I'm have to, having to say to him, no, Michael, we don't burp like that in public or, you know, things like that. <laughs> like now I have to be his mom too. Oh my God. So yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, this is, the thing that people don't get about people with stroke and why I needed to do this podcast was to raise awareness and give people an insight into how challenging it is. You know, our community needs to band together in any way that we can to support each other. How do you go about supporting yourself now? So we're talking about emotionally because your well-being would have been, you know, tested as well. So how do you go about trying to be well? Uh, I have some very dear friends who very lovingly allow me to express my emotions, <laughs> which is just, oh, thank you. Um, but Michael, you know, my husband really does. He, he and I have always had a relationship where there was, there was not a drop that was ever withheld between the two of us. You know, if, if somebody, if he was upset, we would talk about it. If I was scared. He would listen to me. You know, there was never any barrier between us at all. So now, you know, if I'm feeling the slightest bit annoyed or scared or whatever it is I'm feeling, he knows it. And he'll just say, you know, come on, <laughs> tell me what's going on. And he just listens, you know, and I know he understands, you know, because he, he is in there. But that's been the greatest blessing of all, the fact that, that I'm able to just you know, still talk to him and, and express what I'm going through and take care of myself in that way. Um, but, yeah, I think that's, that's basically all I need, just somebody to really listen. Yeah. Um, Royce, are you comfortable uh, me discussing intimacy? Sure. <laughs> there is none. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So how is that? How how do you comp, you know how do you deal with that as well because you know that's something that happens the um, stroke survivor often can't uh, be intimate and wants to be um, is Michael in that space where he's missing that wondering where that went how he can get it back he doesn't even know it's the weirdest thing he doesn't know body parts. <laughs> in fact, one of our friends came to visit him in the rehab hospital, and, and I was telling him, you know, you, you ask Michael where his head is, and he, he has no idea. You know, where's your hand? He has no idea. He still is that way. And my friend said, oh, well, I bet I know a body part that he'd know where it is. And I said, go ahead, ask him. <laughs> he had no clue. So, yeah, that's wow. that's sad. Yeah. Well, wow. I met a man who uh, many years ago who had experienced a stroke and um, he didn't have the concept of a hunger, zero. Oh. Oh. Huh. So I'm not sure if he was overweight when he had his stroke, but he was much larger, he told me, than what he was when I met him. And when I met him, he was just a very thin man and he huh. only came to realize that he had to eat when other people were eating. Otherwise, that was, happens. Is that something that you have experienced with Michael? Yes, I have to say to him, "Are you hungry?" And he'll stop and he'll think about it and he'll ponder it for a minute and he'll say yes. You know, so yeah, I I've never heard that. I thought it was just him. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's fascinating. And when I looked at him and saw him eating, he said, "Yeah, well, I I, I now understand that I have to eat. Um, I don't feel like eating." So I just eat when other people eat, and then that way I won't become unwell. So that's very interesting and bizarre to me, and makes me you know con continuously think about how lucky I was to get away with it. You know, so lightly is the way I put it. Of course, I had my challenges, but I didn't miss any of those major cognitive, um, you know, things that are so important to well-being and life and. Uh, emotional well-being and intimacy. I didn't miss any of that stuff. And I know that the intimacy one is a massive issue for especially partners of people. Um, 
in your book, do you cover any of these topics? What are the things that people can expect to uh, read about when they get a copy of the book? Uh, I probably go into every <laughs> every intimate detail of any gruesome thing that we experienced, any interesting thing that we experienced. Uh, they're very short chapters because they were posts originally. Mm. Um, but I go into everything. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what I talk about, like I said about my posting, is I, I'll talk about something that went on, and then I talk about the lesson that I learned from it, the spiritual lesson that I learned from it, or yeah. the realization that I would have from it. So there's always some kind of a, you know, uh, a lesson or a teaching or something behind whatever it is that I talk about. Um, but there's some, you know, I, I, a lot of it is done with humor, you know, because I, I, he's able to laugh at everything. And so I'm able to laugh at it or eventually get to the point where I can laugh yeah. at it. <laughs> yeah. You know, there was one day that we had just gotten home from somewhere and he started pointing frantically outside. And I said, what, what, what? Go, go, go. I said, but we just got home. He For hours, he sat by the door and wanted to go somewhere. And by, I mean, I would ask him all these questions. Is it life or death? Yes. You know, I mean, really bizarre, you know. And finally, I just said, I, I don't know. It's dinner time now. It's dark. We're not going anywhere. I have no idea where you want to go. You know, I finally just had to drop it. So there are things like that that, you know, <laughs> that sort of left me shaking my head, yeah. you know, but yeah, it's very yeah. interesting, very fun. Those fun little stories that you can laugh at now. Yeah. You have to laugh at them. If you don't laugh at them, it's way too serious a topic and uh, it yeah. could get you down. Um, I remember being in the hospital and I had uh, not been to the toilet after surgery. Uh, and of course, one of the first things that they want you to do is move your bowels and I didn't feel like it, but it's a big, big deal. So, you know, they gave me um, a, an oral uh, chocolate or something that creates, you know, bowel movements, and it didn't work the first day. So they gave me a bunch the second day. <laughs> and then it worked really quickly oh and well. <laughs> and I was in bed and I couldn't walk, and I was calling the nurses to come and help me, and they wouldn't come because they were busy, and I dragged myself into the wheelchair that was next to my bed, and then I r rolled my, myself into the bathroom, which was just at the end of my bed. And as I was going to try and get myself out of the wheelchair, they managed to come in and said, what are you doing? And I said, look, I've got to go to the loo, you know. I really, really have to go right now, you know, get me on there, you know. And uh, they said, why did you get out of your bed? And I said, because you guys have given me this stuff for two days and it's finally working if you don't understand you know, where I'm coming from. And I need to be in there and stop talking, just get me in there, you know. They finally got me on the seat and then they wouldn't leave. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? Well, we can't leave the room. I said, what do you mean you can't leave the room? And, and they said, well, we need to be here in case you fall over and hurt yourself. I said, I am not going anywhere. I will be sitting here. I'm not going anywhere. You must leave the room and close the door. If you don't leave the room, this is going to be really bad. And it took me for what, what seemed like ages for me to, like, get them out of the room. Of course, it was, you know, it was life and death for me. You know, it was ages. I finally got them out of the room and then I just could relax and do the things that I needed to do oh without my gosh. anyone watching. <laughs> And it was so dis distressful at the time. But then when I look back at it now, I thought, like, what were we possibly going to talk about in the toilet while I was doing my business? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I have a whole chapter on uh, the various bathroom things that happened with Michael. Yes, I think I called it golden showers or something like that because yeah. it was, you know, out of control. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. So this is the interesting thing for me is like, you know, we must laugh at it. But I'm glad that you're at the stage where you can because it must help with that underlying, you know, pain and suffering that you do go through, that people go through, you know, yeah. in your waves of emotions, you know. So I'm glad that you can overcome that as well and laugh. Yeah. And I kind of compare it with, and this thought comes to me a lot when I'm in the doldrums, shall we say, where 
would it have been easier if he had just died? You know, because you're, you're kind of living with, with a person that is not the same person that you married. And, you know, it, it's, it's just that fleeting thought of, oh, uh, you know, oh, uh. <laughs> yeah. Look, a carer would think that, and that's not a bad thing. So whoever's listening out here who's thought that, you know, do not feel bad about it. Of course, if he had passed away long term, you know, there would have been things that were completely different. But then you would have been going through the emotional pain and trauma of all that kind of stuff, and that wouldn't have been so good. So there is no better or worse or anything. There's always a situation around stroke, whether somebody lives, passes away, is amazingly well afterwards or not so well. You're never going to reconcile it. You know, people are never going to, we are, we never going to go, oh yeah, that was great that, you know, this happened or yeah, we got the best outcome or whatever. There is no such thing. There is, you do what you can with the, um, ex- with what you've been given and, you know, you make the most of the experiences and you suffer more or less depending on who you are. So there's just no knowing and not a terrible thing for people to think that. I, I really truly don't believe that. I know, you know, in the past many years ago, 20 years ago, we lost one of our loved ones to cancer. You know, he was 31. And the the, the feeling that we felt after the suffering that he experienced, which was way more extreme than I've ever seen anybody suffer, was relief. Yeah. Yeah. But I had to reconcile that with myself. You know, I had to understand why I'm feeling relief. And it wasn't, I never lived with him. I wasn't his main carer. So even during that experience when somebody else passed away, like it was relief. And I felt bad about that, but that's not really something to feel bad about. Neither is what your thoughts were. It's just what it is. And we're human. And those things are logical thought processes. And uh, I don't see, I don't, I, I wouldn't like to think that people are beating up themselves about, having that thought have you know entered their mind once in a while. So you know, it just is what it is. It's tough. You're not mm-hmm. it wasn't your task on this planet to be the person who was going to learn all these skills to one day go into this because you can't foresee that. When you're in there, you're dealing with somebody, you know, your the carers tend to be the type of people who are lacking resources more than anybody else because it happens overnight. It's very true. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't beat myself up for having that thought. It's just kind of an odd juxtaposition to think he's here, but he's not really here. (laughs) You know, he's a different person. I don't know. I can't even really put it into words. Just just those fleeting thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. What does Michael like to do other than jigsaws, other than puzzles? Does he have anything that he appreciates doing or... He does, they have art classes at his rehab hospital. And he's always been artsy. You know, we owned a a shop gallery place. And he had this wonderful teacher. And this teacher has brought out this talent like you just wouldn't believe. He's doing these amazing paintings. And he loves it. He's passionate about it. And recently he started doing these little, he takes a pen And he does these little dots all over the paper. And he does these drawings out of dots. And he'll spend, I don't know, 20 hours. And these these things emerge. And he doesn't plan them. They just emerge. And they're just amazing. Wow. Yeah, so he loves that. Yeah, he really does. And this is the strange thing. You know, I I, I don't know, you know, what other people experience. um, uh, Only one by one as I talk to people, yourself. as an example and then you hear about these new things that emerge from people and isn't it amazing how the brain even though it's missed it's missing that part that allows him to pay attention or to be um, aware of certain things or to have passion or focus for the old stuff that he used to do here's something that is coming on for this new task yeah, yeah. and he's got a really good talent and we wouldn't have seen it if we hadn't had this crazy I experience. <laughs> I know. It's so bizarre. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think about that a lot too. It's like, well, you know, everything happens for a reason as the cliche goes, yeah. but you know, this is really bringing out some amazing talent in him. You know? yeah. Tell me about the book and the way that it's been received by the people that have uh, 
got a copy. What the what have been some of the feedback that you've had about the book? Well, everybody loves it. They um, the comments basically have been that you know the the level of authenticity, the level of depth that I get into, the spiritual lessons that I explain. Um, you know, there's so many different levels that people are reading it in uh, or on. So, yeah, it's getting very well received. Yeah. Where can people buy the book? Is it uh, available online or in a hard copy? How do they get it? Yeah, it's on Amazon. You can get either the ebook or a paperback version of it. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. So, even that is an amazing thing that of all the uh, challenges that people face, you know, you've been able to go, well, how can I share this and make it better for other people? As well as, I imagine for you, was it a little bit cathartic for you to write the yes. book and get it out there? <laughs> Definitely, yes. Yeah, especially, like I said, people reacting to it in that way. I just thought I was posting some cute little, you know, heart-wrenching or or open, silly posts telling people about what's going on. And to have the reactions that I had were, it was just phenomenal to me, you yeah. know. Yeah, well, it's a really brave thing that you did, and it's really important that you did it, obviously for yourself, but for other people going um, going through that, how did how do you feel knowing that you've impacted somebody? Well, I'm not sure how you've impacted them, but obviously people get impacted. How does it feel to know that, again, from this crazy experience, this has come from it? It feels, it's hard to put it into words, but I've always felt like I'm here to make some kind of a difference. You know, the classes that I would teach, the spiritual classes that I would teach were always very small and intimate. I was, I've been doing it for 40 years. Um, but I've always felt like there's something that I'm supposed to bring here that's going to help people in a bigger way. Um, maybe that's maybe that's what this book will do. I don't know. I hope so. I do hope so. Yeah. The books that I've read that are about um, stroke healing, recovery experiences are uh, have really brought me to tears. You know, sometimes they've made me um, feel uh, like I'm not alone. They've made me feel uh, like someone else understands me. You know, so that thing that you're talking about, that you did about, you know, somehow serving and supporting others, you know, is really a massive blessing for us, you know. So I want to thank you for doing that for the community at large, but, you know, specifically for, you know, my community, our community, you know, uh, which wasn't one that I chose, which chose me. And I imagine, do you feel like that kind of way as well, where this, this thing has chosen you and now let's do something positive with it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, everything that I've gone through in my life, I felt that way about, but particularly this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't you know, I don't think that it's an a, an accident that <laughs> that with my awareness and with you know the the um the purposefulness that I feel about my life, I I'm, I know that this was given to me to do something with. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you are doing something with it. Um how do you see the next few months years rolling out for you? What do you hope to achieve and how do you hope to grow from this, you know, even more as you go forward? Uh, well, because he's not making huge leaps and bounds in his progress, I'm kind of taking it one one day at a time, as they say. Um, I'm trying to put together the courses that I used to give in person. I'm trying to turn them into uh, online seminars. So that's been my project lately. Uh, I've never wanted to do it in that way. I've always wanted to have the one-on-one -on -one intimate level of teaching that I give because it's really pretty intense. Yeah. Um, but I've decided to do it, so I'm doing it. Yeah, great. Uh, but yeah, I I don't know. I'm just kind of taking it day by day, really. There's no better way to take it day by day. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> minute by minute. Sometimes hour yeah. by hour. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, I think you're being really brave. Um, and I, I say that, you know, from the true meaning of the word brave, not from the, you know, brave and, you know, 
brave that you're able to take this experience, look at it, uh, observe it, and make something out of it and turn it into uh, at least part of it into a positive uh, experience for people. Um, I really am grateful to have come across your your work and your book. I'll be um, very keen to download a copy and have a look at it as well and read it. Um, I found that the more I do that, the more it helps. So I'm so grateful for other people that have done done that. I've considered writing a book myself, but I don't have the mental capacity and the energy to do that yet. I think that's a little bit in the future for me. So I'm just glad that there's people like you that you know take on this thing that was thrust upon them and find a way to turn it into a positive experience. It makes a massive difference to me. I know to all the other people that have read the book, that have given you feedback, and definitely to Michael, even even though I don't know Michael, I know that it's made a huge difference in his life. Yes, I think it has too. Yeah. So thank you. On that note, where can somebody go and find a copy of your book or download a copy of your book? Is there a website that you have? Tell us about that. Um, I do have it on my personal website, and my website is perfectlifeawakening.com, and it's also available on Amazon. Actually, I've, I've got two other books that are all of them. They're all all of them on my website and on Amazon. Okay. Yeah, the first the first book that I wrote was about my relationship. It's actually a fictionalized story about my relationship with my husband, and went from that and wrote a book about my teachings and then wrote a book about his stroke. So it's been kind of a, a series, actually. Well, lovely. Yeah. And um, they're all available to be purchased from your website or only from Amazon? From Amazon, yeah. But you, you can click on them on my website yep. or just go directly to Amazon. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate you spending some time with me on the podcast. It's a real pleasure to get to know you a little bit. Yeah, you too. Thank you for the work that you do. And I look forward to keeping in touch with you and just following whatever it is that you do uh, going forward. Great. Thank you so much. And you just don't ever lose hope either. Yeah, my <laughs> pleasure. We'll, I definitely yeah. will not. I've got people like you that encourage me every day as well. And the feedback from the podcast is the same as well. You know, it's amazing. I, I started it out as um, a little bit of a selfish thing. I can't write a book. So I talk. In, in words and I, I do it like that and create episodes instead of chapters instead of posts I, I do episodes it's my yeah. my way of doing it and it's been great I really got more back from the feedback and I'm not I'm sure you experienced this than I did from actually writing it so yeah I'm so grateful for the feedback everyone else out there who's listening and wants to send either me or Royce feedback please please do. definitely yeah yeah yeah, because I don't think I've seen. I was going to mention this before. I don't. I haven't seen any books written by caregivers. I've seen books, you know, written by stroke survivors, yeah. but nothing really from the caregiver viewpoint. So I think it's kind of an important thing to support people that are doing what I'm doing. Absolutely, yeah. and I think there's more work in that for you going forward. In that, the caregivers are the ones I believe sometimes doing it tougher than the um, than the stroke survivor because. Like Michael, if he's unaware, he's doing it tough, but he's not doing it that tough, perhaps. But the caregiver's got to change everything. And this thing that has happened hasn't happened to them. It's happened to somebody else, and they've got to change. Like, it's a big deal. You know, my wife went through the same thing, and I was able to later on understand how I impacted her life negatively, initially, if you like but then also positively, but the awareness of how I impacted her life negatively made me feel like I need to share more stories about more caregivers, about what they go through and create a community for caregivers. So part of the work that I'm doing on the website uh, is I'm creating a membership section, which is almost ready to go live, which enables people to come in and learn from my teachings, the stuff that I uh, have learned about healing stroke, healing the brain, recovering from that, um, you know, from, you know, studies that other people have done in nutrition and in meditation and in all those types of things. But there's going to be a special section there for carers to get together 
and hopefully find some common ground and support each other as well as um, uh, as well as you know raise awareness. So I suppose um, uh, I have a a real desire to make carers' lives easier. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah, because be even at even even at Michael's rehab hospital, they have stroke survivors group. They have, you know, every group in the world. They don't have a caregiver support group, which I think is a real shame. You know, Royce, I've suggested it several times. Nope. <laughs> Royce, it might be something that you need to just start up yourself. I know, I know. People have said that to me. I'm I'm pondering it. Yep. Yeah. I know. We'll yep. we'll maybe just squeeze that in into all the, uh, you know, the. Empty slots in your day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'm definitely considering it. Thank yeah, you. I get it. I get it. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I re- really, you. really appreciate it. This is great. Thank you. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.